Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. On behalf of uh, Kennedy School Dean Joseph Nye and Institute of Politics Director uh, David Pryor, let me welcome you to the Kennedy School of Government and our Public Affairs Forum. Ira Jackson is my name. I'm director of the Center for Business and Government here at the Kennedy School, which is proudly hosting this forum event and co-hosting, along with the Department of Justice, a three-day-long important conference on DNA and the criminal justice system, of which this forum is our kickoff event. Uh, let me uh, say something about the bunting uh, and the commissioners in our front two rows and the presence of a state Supreme Court justice as well as the Klieg lights. We are not witnessing the hand counting of ballots <laughs> in the forum today, but we are making history uh, in some other respects, and we are engaged in a civic lesson of our own because the commissioners arrayed in front of me and behind those of you in the audience are members of an official national commission on the future of DNA evidence, and they will be formally accepting expert testimony from our four nationally recognized expert presenters today, and the commission is chaired by the Chief Justice of the Wisconsin uh, state Supreme Court. The bunting, I might add, is the remnant uh, of a public affairs celebration which we had in this space on Friday night where we honored Sheila Burke, former Chief of Staff to uh, Senator Bob Dole and Sir Donald Tsang, the Financial Secretary of Hong Kong, who were both distinguished alums of the Kennedy School of Government. This forum is where the Kennedy School meets the community, where our faculty engages in politics, in discussion with the public and uh, the media. Uh, we've had hundreds of events in this space over the last 20 years, including presidents and vice presidential debates and even kings and queens, but I don't believe that we have ever before had an official formal meeting of a national commission, so we're making history this afternoon as well, and we're very, very pleased and proud that you could join us. My role is simply to discuss logistics, to quickly introduce the panelists, and then to turn uh, the microphone over to Chief Justice Abrahamson for the main event. So without further ado, let me explain that after we hear briefly from the four panelists who have been asked to limit their remarks to no more than 10 minutes, the commission will have an opportunity for about 15 minutes of dialogue and Q&A of our distinguished panelists, and then those of you in the audience will have an opportunity about equal in length uh, to have questions, not deliver speeches, but to pose questions to our expert panelists. There'll be two mics uh, on, here on the floor and in the, on the second floor balcony, and I would suggest those of you in the public who wish to uh, ask questions queue up at the end of the formal presentations by the panelists. What a distinguished panel indeed we have. Beginning will be a Garland Allen, who's a population geneticist and a professor of biology at Washington University and in St. Louis, where he's been on the faculty since 1967. Dr. Allen's research interests are in the area of history and philosophy of biology, particularly genetics, embryology, and evolution, and their interrelationships. For the last 20 years, Dr. Allen has been working on the scientific, economic, and social history of eugenics, particularly in the United States. Dr. Allen has always combined scholarship with teaching and began his teaching career, I'm sure Harvard undergraduates would like to know, as a teaching fellow in George Wald's celebrated undergraduate course on biology. He's currently at work on his latest textbook, The Process of Science, How Do We Know? Paul Billings is co-founder of Gene Sage and editor-in-chief of Gene Letter. He's an expert in clinical genetics, immunogenetics, and the impact of genetic technology on society. He's also chief medical officer of the Heart of Texas Veterans Healthcare System. A former member of the Harvard Medical School faculty, he formerly was chief of the Division of Genetic Medicine at Pacific Presbyterian Medical Center and founder of the Center in Inherited Diseases, as well as leading the program in genetics 
and society. He's published over 100 scholarly articles and has written a book, DNA on Trial, Genetic Identification, and Criminal Justice. James D. Watson is best known for his discovery of the structure of DNA, for which he shared with Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins the 1962 Nobel Prize. In 1968, Dr. Watson became director and subsequently president of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in Long Island, where he steered the laboratory into the field of tumor virology, from which emerged our present understanding of oncogenes and the molecular basis of cancer. He was appointed director of the National Center for Human Genome Research at the National Institute of Health and helped to launch a worldwide effort to map and sequence the human genome. He's the recipient of 22 honorary degrees, the author of five books. His discovery of the elegantly simple structure of the double helix with its twisted ladder, rings, and rails has inspired and stimulated a revolution in molecular biology and genetics, which has and continues to have a profound effect on both science and society. Lyndon J. Eaves is a behavioral geneticist. Dr. Eaves is distinguished professor of human genetics and a member of the Department of Psychiatry at Virginia Commonwealth University. He's also co-director of the newly established Virginia Institute for Psychiatric and Behavioral Genetics at VCU. He's been involved in twin research for nearly 30 years and is recognized as a world leader in the development of genetic models that have been useful in elucidating the mechanisms by which genetic and environmental influences might operate on developmental traits. Dr. Eves is an Episcopal priest and priest in residence at St. James Church in Richmond, Virginia, and he serves on the presiding bishop's task force on science, technology, and faith. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Shirley S. Abrahamson was first appointed to the Wisconsin State Supreme Court by Governor Patrick Lucey in 1976. At that time, she was the only woman on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. She was elected in 1979 to the court, reelected in 89 and 99, and has served as Chief Justice for the last four years. A native of New York City, a graduate of NYU and Indiana University Law School with a doctorate of law in American legal history from the University of Wisconsin Law School. She is the recipient of 14 honorary degrees, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an elected member of the American Philosophical Society, and most importantly for today's proceedings, the chairperson of the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence. Please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Shirley Abrahamson. Good afternoon. On behalf of uh, the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence and the National Institute of Justice and the Department of Justice, we want to thank Harvard University, the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and the Center for Business and Government for hosting the uh, National Commission's uh, meeting today and for uh, sponsoring uh, with us the uh, conference that we will be having on uh, DNA and the criminal justice system. My task uh, this afternoon is to very briefly tell you something about the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence. The commission was created in 1998 at the request of Attorney General Janet Reno. When she read about the use of DNA to exonerate someone wrongfully convicted of race, a rape and homicide, she became concerned that others might also have been wrongfully uh, convicted. The Attorney General directed the National Institute of Justice to identify how often DNA has exonerated wrongfully convicted defendants. After extensive study, the National Institute of Justice published the report, Convicted by Juries, Exonerated by Science, 
case studies and the use of DNA evidence to establish innocence after trial. This publication presents case studies of 28 inmates for whom DNA analysis was exculpatory. On learning of the breadth and scope of the issues related to forensic DNA, the Eternal Attorney General asked NIJ to establish the commission as a means to examine the future of DNA evidence and how the Justice Department could encourage its most effective use. The commission was appointed by the former director of the National Institute of Justice, Jeremy Travis, who will uh, participate in the uh, conference later. The commission represents a broad spectrum of the criminal justice system, and the commissioners are seated uh, before us uh, today because uh, they will be hearing uh, this panel on behavioral genetics, and it will be part of our proceedings. And the commission members represent a broad spectrum of the criminal justice system. Uh, we have law enforcement, we have um, the FBI, we have bureaus of forensic services, we have uh, academicians, we have uh, philosophers and ethicists, lawyers, prosecuting attorneys, defense attorneys. And they did speak to each other during the commission meetings, sometimes pleasantly. <laughs> And always we gathered together uh, in, I think, a, an informative and good manner to decide what we could agree on and what we could not agree on. And I, I left out a rather important member of the commission in my broad description, and that is uh, Catherine Terman, who is representing victims from the Office of Victims. If the commissioners would rise so people could see you, I'd appreciate that. Would you stand up, please? <laughs> And we had an excellent staff led by Chris Asplin and Elisa Foreman, and we thank them. The commission's charge was to submit recommendations to the Attorney General that will help ensure that more effective use of DNA is made as a, as a crime fighting tool. And the commission's goal is also to foster its use throughout the entire criminal justice system. We divide it into, a five, into several working groups, which include post-conviction remedies, crime scene investigation, and evidence collection, laboratory funding, legal issues, and research and development. The commission's working groups included both commissioners and others. We attempted to uh, reach out and get commentary from as many people that we could using all the modern tools uh, such as the uh, internet as well as uh, snail mail. The uh, working of the commission is drawing to an end and uh, we will uh, submit to uh, the Attorney General a, a draft report uh, soon. So with that, that is what the Commission has been doing and uh, what we will continue to be doing. And after the panel, the Commissioners will have an opportunity to raise questions uh, with the panel. And then the um, panel will be open to questions from the audience and uh, Ira Jackson will lead that. Now, if um, if there is a need for or a desire for the sign interpreter, we will continue uh, his use. So would you signify to us that uh, his use should be continued? If not, it will stop. There is no response. So with that, I want to say thank you to you. And should we need you, we will use you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, organizers at the Kennedy School for uh, putting on this forum. 
Uh, let me make one disclaimer from the introduction. I'm not a population geneticist. I feel as the history and philosophy of science, uh, particularly genetics, though, and I've spent much of my uh, work in that area looking at the history of the Mendelian chromosome theory in the early part of the 20th century, particularly the work of Thomas Hunt Morgan, uh, who was the first Nobel laureate in genetics, and then the spinoff from that, the history of eugenics in the period of the teens, 20s, and 30s, especially in this country. So I come to this from a particularly uh, uh, historical point of view, but I've also spent a considerable amount of time teaching introductory biology and consequently have been forced to see that there's a lot of similarity to claims that are being made today as those made 50, 60, 70 years ago. And I'm just going to run very quickly through uh, some of the slides that I have here to illustrate the degree to which there has been a popular flurry of attention devoted in the, the uh, mass media to claims about genetic bases for all sorts of human conditions. Uh, Life magazine had a cover story, uh, so did Atlantic Monthly about general personality traits. Uh, in addition to these, there have been a number of rather specific claims, claims, for example, about the inheritance of alcoholism, of shyness, of uh, manic depression localized originally in one set of studies on chromosome 11. Uh, infidelity, <laughs> homosexuality, uh, IQ and the relation of IQ and race. Particularly important in these uh, popular claims have been uh, ones focusing on crime and violent behavior. Uh, this was really initiated in its most modern form as within the last 15 years by the 1985 book by uh, Richard Hernstein and James Q. Wilson called Crime and Human Nature. Uh, it was a rather thick compendium of studies that went back all the way to the beginning of the century, uh, tracing out some kind of biological more markers to uh, uh, criminal and violent acts. Uh, this has been picked up in intervening years by such claims as you see here at U.S. News and World Report. The NIH has launched a major violence initiative to try to combine sociological and biological studies for the basis of inner city uh, youth violence. And the frequency with which these has come about has prompted one of my colleagues to talk about the gene of the month club or this cartoonist uh, to say, Eureka, I've discovered the gene that makes us think that everything is composed of genes. I'm going to approach this in the very few minutes I have here from a skeptical point of view, skeptical both from history and skeptical both from the point of view of the current level of studies that go on to claim that various specific behaviors in human beings, social complex behaviors are genetically based. I think this interest reflects at the present time both the enormous uh, and outstanding growth in the field of molecular genetics itself, including the uh, human genome and other genome projects, some very exciting things that are going on. It also represents a considerable amount of research, mostly by psychiatrists and psychologists, about uh, the genes uh, that affect human hereditary personality and behavior. Both research efforts have included in their public image optimistic promises to cure all sorts of personal and social ills through genetic engineering, that is replacing dysfunctional genes with functional ones, or through pharmacotherapy, that is using drugs to compensate for the altered products of defective genes. Now, whether these promises are realistic or not is another story. It's not really the subject for tonight. What I do want to talk about this evening is the general relevance of claims about a genetic basis for human social personality and behavioral traits for the criminal justice system. And this is really what, in my understanding, the genetic, uh, behavioral genetics is. Uh, I'm sorry to be the, the first to speak because perhaps behavioral geneticists uh, could better present their own claims, uh, and undoubtedly you'll hear more of that later on. But basically it is the notion that rather specific uh, human traits, as the ones we've seen in the slides, are determined by a significant to a significant degree by genes, most claims are not single genes anymore, but by uh, two or more uh, interacting genes. But the claim is that this is a significant contribution to the outcome of that behavior uh, in uh, adults. Now there are several questions that I'd like to pose. Uh, one set of questions focuses on the genetic claims themselves. What do these claims about human behavior entail? How are they actually made and how are they substantiated? How valid are these claims given the methods and therefore the data available for answering them? 
And can genetic claims uh, be predictive for human behavioral outcomes, at least from what we know at the present time? A second set of questions focuses on the use to which such claims, even if they could be shown to be scientifically valid, should be put in issues of human justice. Can genetic claims be used to identify potential offenders and thus serve as a, some sort of preventive role? Can genetic claims be used in defense argument for offenders in much the same way as psychiatric arguments are used now uh, to ameliorate sentences? My contention is that claims about a major genetic component to most human social behaviors is based largely on circumstantial evidence at the present time and also on a simplistic and naive notion of how biological and especially genetic systems actually work. Let me first turn to the status of current claims of human behavior genetics. As the next slide shows, which is a, uh, this, uh, the implications of uh, Genetics of criminality, for example, have been picked up in the political arena. Mayor Koch, who reviewed the Wilson and Hernstein book shortly after it was published, uh, drew what uh, is often claimed to be one of the obvious conclusions of genetic uh, behavior work, and that is that uh, certain individuals are biologically, indeed, genetically. Uh, 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 these are traits when combined with an uncertain moral environment uh, produce criminal behavior. Moreover, these traits can uh, barely be changed, if at all. A new realism has been introduced into the crime and punishment debate, a recognition that government cannot change human or be expected to change human nature. And I think that's a very serious implication to be drawn. It's one that's been drawn throughout the whole of the 20th century about genetic claims, that they're unchangeable, they're immutable, and second, that they indeed tell us that nothing can be done to rectify those problems. A second kind of implication uh, is in fact one that has already been introduced in court cases, uh, as reported in the Wall Street Journal, uh, where a plea that uh, the, a, the genotype, the collection of genes of an individual, uh, made that person uh, unwilling uh, committer of, uh, of violent homicidal action and should be taken into account in uh, judging the sentence. Now let me emphasize that I think the field of behavior genetics especially as applied to non-human animals, is a very valuable and valid enterprise in the biological realm. In situations where you can study and control both the genetic matings of the individuals you're looking at and the environments in which their offspring are raised, you can make some very interesting judgments about how genes and how environments interact to produce a phenotype. Studies of uh, bird song development, courtship, uh, sociality in the uh, higher primates, uh, spider web building, a whole host of animal studies have produced some very interesting and very valid, repeatable scientific work. Unfortunately, that has not been the case uh, with a good percentage of the studies that go under the heading of behavioral genetics. And when Scientific American several years ago published a lack of progress report in this field, uh, they summarized some of the studies at that time that had been introduced and then either quietly faded from the scene or were publicly withdrawn and included most of the studies in the categories that we have already talked about, such as crime, manic depression, schizophrenia, alcoholism, intelligence, and homosexuality. Now, I don't have much time to go into the complex uh, of problems associated with these studies, but let me just emphasize a couple that I think would well warn us to be cautious of making strong claims uh, in this area. Uh, this is simply a summary of some of the major uh, research problems that are engendered in doing this kind of work. Uh, the first is defining the trait, phenotype it's called, the way the individual behaves. Uh, there are two problems with this. One is all human behaviors are quite complex, and there is the danger of reification, that is, of treating what seems outwardly like the same behavior as if it comes from the same cause. It would be like treating all automobile accidents as, they had, as if they had the same antecedent events, simply because the net effect was two vehicles collided. Uh, you can't reify a complex behavior uh, when it has many multiple strands that lead into its uh, coming about. The second problem is that many of these are quite biased definitions. What is criminality? What is a criminal behavior? 
Was Robin Hood a criminal or was he a hero? And it would depend on who you talk to uh, in medieval England. So there's a problem of defining these traits. This is nowhere more apparent than in the psychiatric realm where there's a great deal of difficulty with shifting definitions of schizophrenia uh, and manic depression. Are they the same uh, conditions with different manifestations? Are they two ends of the same spectrum? Are they two separate diseases? What is an alcoholic? Uh, how do you define that? Uh, these are very complex issues. The other issue I simply want to point, talk to today uh, a little bit is the, uh, third, the fourth one down. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, well, uh, one is particularly the uh, lack of, it's not listed on this list actually, but the problem of how it is that genetic systems work. How do you go from a fertilized egg with a set of genes contributed by each parent to an adult trait, especially in human beings, uh, such as a behavior? What are the factors uh, that influence that? So I'd love to talk about these other uh, problems. Uh, we can discuss them if people have questions during the uh, discussion period, but I'm going to move on because of time. This chart simply shows a very simple scheme of what happens when a genotype, which is the sum total of the genes that are uh, inherited by an organism at fertilization from its two parents, uh, to the phenotype, which is the trait that you're interested in. Phenotypes can be physical or physiological traits, or in the case of what concerns us tonight, they're behavioral traits. Now, genes produce proteins, the most immediate product of a gene, and Proteins interact with each other in the developing embryo as the cells divide through a whole process known as embryogenesis or simply developmental uh, processes. And the multiple arrows suggest that there are innumerable stages in that process. And it's one of the least understood but most exciting frontiers of research in animal and plant development at the present time. But in that area of embryogenesis is one where inputs come from two very different sources, but these inputs interact in the development of this organism. If we're talking about human beings, then embryogenesis includes intrauterine development as well as post-uterine, postnatal uh, development of the infant into an adolescent and ultimately an adult. The two sets of factors that influence this are the genetic background, that is, what other genes uh, the individual inherits from its parents in addition to the genes of interest. If one is looking at alcoholism or criminality, what other genetic background is in existence in that fertilized egg? And how are those genes going to interact with each other? That's a very complex issue, and human beings have many, many genes that interact with one another. One of the most common forms of interaction is called epistasis, where the effect of two or more genes produces an outcome that is not predictable from knowledge of just the effect of one of those genes by itself. But the second in input is environmental background. Environmental background intrauterine, what the diet of the mother is, what drugs, what uh, materials uh, pass across the placenta uh, to the developing uh, infant uh, fetus are increased incredibly important in understanding how development occurs, as well as postnatal environment, especially where you're talking about things as plastic as behaviors. So we have these two forms of input, and into that embryogenesis process is where the interaction between genes and environments takes place. And if one is going to argue about a significant genetic component, then one has to know and one has to have details about that environmental input as well as that genetic background input. You simply cannot talk about genes by themselves. They do not unfold like uh, preformed embryos uh, that were described in the 17th century as being little miniature humans that simply grew in size after fertilization. So it's a very important point to emphasize that development is the key to understanding how genotypes become transformed into phenotypes. Now, I want to take one quick case to conclude, and that is to take a case of something that is not a behavioral trait, but that is a relatively well-known, well-documented case of human inheritance, cystic fibrosis. It's a condition which has, in its severest form, uh, a great uh, number of clinical manifestations. Uh, particularly, we know it for its effects on the lungs, where it reduces uh, airflow because of the accumulation of mucus on the epithelial surface. Uh, but in fact, it affects many other organs, the pancreas, the intestines, uh, and so on. So it has a pleiotropic or a multitude of effects on other parts of the body. And what's particularly interesting about this example and why I'm using it is because 
there is much, much known about the nature of this uh, condition. What you see here is a diagram that shows at the top uh, the gene, which has been completely sequenced. Uh, the number of mutations within that gene now amount to something over 800. Uh, we know from most of them uh, the point of that mutation is known. The effect of that on the protein is known. The protein is the second line down or bar down. But that's the product of that gene. And then the third bar down shows that, that we know about the physiology of that gene. It forms a membrane channel uh, in cell membranes, particularly of epithelial or, or lining cells, and it controls the flow of chloride ions. So here's a case where everything at multitude of levels is known, genetic level, protein level, physiological, phenotypic level. And then the final phenotype, of course, is the clinical cases presented with indivi by individuals who have these conditions. Now, what's particularly important is that the most severe mutation uh, that you have is called delta F508. Uh, if you have two copies of that, you will very likely show rather severe clinical manifestations. On the other hand, the effect on different organ systems varies from individual to individual in unpredictable ways. Lung uh, pathology, for example, tends to be one of the least predictable of the phenotypic outcomes, even if you have the most severe uh, genotype for that condition. If you have one of those F508 mutations plus a number of other ones, you will have a variety of other outcomes, many of which are simply not predictable for individual to individual. General predictability is possible, but not for individuals. Now, what, the, what this, that last diagram showed was just the range of phenotypic expressions that you can see, and it ranges, that diagonal line shows that essentially the range goes from a very large phenotypic effect, very severe clinical problems, to almost no manifestations at all, and these don't correlate on any kind of one-to-one -one basis to uh, the genetic makeup, the genotype of individuals. So this has prompted one of the uh, review articles to, uh, which looked at cystic fibrosis to simply argue that uh, you can't make any kind of simple predictions uh, from these conditions. I don't know whether that's terribly readable up there or not, uh, but you, I, we can look at it a little bit later. I have it, I can read it to you just to make sure it's, it, the point is, is clear. Um, And that is inheritance of CFTR, which is just the abbreviation name for uh, the, the defective protein uh, uh, in cystic fibrosis. Uh, mutations in acquiring the phenotype are merely the beginning and ending in the succession of a series of events leading to CF phenotype. These intermediary events include only partially known processes at the molecular cellular and organ levels. A CFTR genotype constitutes only a potential predisposition for CF disease, which will be to various degrees expressed and translated into CF pathophysiology. As shown by many studies, the process of genotype realization is a complex and variable one. Even inheritance of the same mutations can result in remarkably variable manifestations of disease. This is especially true for the pulmonary component of the CF phenotype, which is the most variable and least reliably predicted on the basis of genotype. I have a couple of other quotes that say the same thing. I'm not going to uh, dwell on those at the moment. But let me conclude by referring to the area that I've spent a lot of time studying in the last 20 years, and that is the history of similar claims made for genetic certainty uh, and the public policy outcomes of those in the early 20th century. And that is a movement called eugenics that was based on the exciting new work being done in Mendelian genetics in the first three decades of the 20th century. And what eugenicists, among other things, were able to do was to make a strong enough series of claims that were not contradicted at the time, often in public by uh, the people who did contradict them later, uh, about sterilization and about immigration restriction. Uh, in over 35 states by 1935, sterilization laws had been passed for the allowing the compulsory sterilization of individuals in state institutions de uh, decreed to be genetically inferior or the potential bearers of defect, genetically defective offspring. And by the 1960s, the sum total of sterilizations under these laws in the United States had reached something like 60 plus thousand. Now, in 
in Germany, especially after 1933, the number of sterilizations rose to 400,000. But the public policy implication of that was based on the scientific claims that there was a kind of hard wiring between genotype and phenotype. And I want to close by simply warning that uh, we exist in a certain, in a degree right now, of scientific uncertainty about these claims that the exaggerated uh, public presentations have led many people in the lay and reading public to think that a lot more is known and determined by our genes than the data will supply, and that we need to be excessively cautious in the future about applying these in the criminal justice system at whatever level. Thank you. Well, I too um, am very uh, grateful to the National Commission and to the organizers here at Harvard for inviting me back to Cambridge. Uh, I do want to make uh, one correction both in my introduction and the printed materials, which is that I am no longer a federal employee, which really means I can finally speak my piece. Um, I have prepared a draft of my comments, which I circulated. If anyone didn't get one and would like one, I'd be happy to give it to them. Uh, also, my comments do not reflect those of my company, uh, which is uh, seeking to translate uh, genomics and human genetics into something useful for people, but really are my own, and are derived uh, from my 12 years of study of genetic discrimination and attitudes towards biotechnology in our society, uh, also partly derived uh, from my experience as medical director uh, of the Mass Medical, uh, a Mass Mental Health Center here in uh, Boston and uh, my contact with forensic uh, DNA studies, which began in the late 1980s at a symposium in Cold Spring Harbor, where I had the unique pleasure of bunking with uh, Peter Neufeld, which is something quite memorable. Um, you never forget that. So um, my task really was to uh, set out to uh, talk about uh, the basics of uh, behavioral genetics, uh, given my background as a clinician and a geneticist. And um, I, I would say, first of all, that we're all fascinated with human behavior, and uh, we don't really know why, but uh, it probably serves uh, many functions uh, in our lives. Uh, biological, developmental, historical, social, cultural, economic, and political, and other factors play a role in the definition, description, and interpretations of human behavior that we use for ourselves and in differentiating our behavior from those noted in our families, neighborhoods, society at large. Now, whatever definition of behavior we use for ourselves, we know it changes, and there are many examples of which uh, the one that I included in my notes was that the same behavior might be called justifiable homicide or premeditated murder. Now, genetics seeks to explain human development and variance through the action of genes and the DNA sequences, intermediaries, or polypeptide products that arise from them. While most geneticists currently acknowledge the critical role of gene with environment interactions in all phases of gene action, they remain properly and professionally focused on isolating the relevant genes genetic component of a trait that they're interested in. That's their expertise. 19th and 20th century human genetics has tried to provide useful information about human behavior. And the list of behaviors that uh, 19th and 20th century uh, human geneticists have tried to take on is long and sordid. Uh, it includes drunkenness, vagrancy, thalassophilia, which is men's love of the sea, which you can imagine what chromosome that was associated with. Um, uh, the a fact of being a slave, criminality, imbecility, promiscuity, sexual deviance, homosexuality, thrill-seeking, and other traits. Three generations of imbeciles in this century were enough for the state of Virginia and Justice Holmes to force the sterilization of Carrie Buck to save her and society from further genetically determined burden. Uh, one of your commissioners, my colleague Phil Riley, is a national expert on sterilization uh, for genetic reasons. Using anecdotes, twin family and adoption studies, and a variety of association or linkage methods, this science has suggested that behavior can have a genetic component, 
that some behaviors and psychiatric illnesses may have a larger genetic influence in some people than others, that some diseases have major genetic risk factors that can affect behavior, and very little else. The enterprise to date has not made a significant contribution in the care of patients, and one has to remember that psychiatric illness is an enormous cause of suffering in our society. We understand virtually nothing about it and uh, is uh, just something that deserves a lot of attention. And it really hasn't, so genetics has really not really affected the care of patients or our understanding of behavior in social or other contexts. Now, why is this so? The traits studied are too variable, indicating both significant environmental and variants from other sources unrelated to genes. Genes do not appear to be causing behavior or are not major influencers of the variance in behaviors in a significant enough number of people to facilitate their study. Those genes that do have reliable measurable effects may only do so in certain very limited situations. And uh, as you look at genetic data as it comes out in the future days, remember what context it was created in and look for whether it's been tested in other contexts. Mechanisms of gene action are not known and so are not themselves testable. Doing behavioral genetic studies is cumbersome and costly. Approaches have, been tr have tried historically to link genotypes or surrogates for genotypes, uh, uh, phenotypes, excuse me, have phenotypes, which as I said have problems with definition, to surrogates for genotypes. Genomic approaches, which is a comprehensive, using comprehensive genomic knowledge, may allow us to reverse uh, that uh, process and are now beginning to occur. Now, the result of the history of behavioral genetics has been a certain kind of division of the information into the genetics of normal behavior, and there animal models are, are particularly useful, the genetics of traits associated with behavior or illness, and that might be addictions uh, as an example of that, the genetics of psychiatric illness, schizophrenia and depression have been uh, focuses of study, the genetics of substances or environmental influencers of behavior, so how psychoactive drugs, for instance, are metabolized and uh, their targets, and the genetics of disorders that can have behavioral symptoms, and some examples of that are Huntington's disease, Wilson's disease, porphyria, and many others. Now, new technology will allow more complete associations of genome types with behavior, protein arrays with behavior, and very fast testing. These technical develops, may, uh, developments may allow this information to be used in new ways and in new settings. Now, what will the result of this new technology likely be? And I'm giving you my best guesses as they come along. Well, I think the first result will be whole new definitions of psychiatric illness and some behaviors. There'll be a, uh, the definitions will arise from genomic information rather than from associations with genomic information. Some more powerful predictors of behavior may be developed from genomic types or protein expression. But most genotypes will remain only modestly predictive across a range of environments like those found in our country. Genetic information, on the other hand, will be provided at birth, and this modestly predictive genetic information will alter many aspects of human development. I mean, newborn testing, which is a widely uh, used uh, uh, technology now, is going to be enhanced. It may be enhanced uh, for uh, tests that have primarily behavioral um, um, correlates, and that will be uh, an enormously important in uh, how we raise our children, how we, our parents, how we uh, engage in health-seeking behavior and many other things. In, in addition, prenatal selection on behavioral grounds may expand. While states support, for instance, the detection and determination of fetuses with trisomy 21 syndrome, or Down syndrome as many people call it, uh, it is uh, certainly theoretically conceivable uh, that uh, the genes uh, or chromosomes associated with unacceptable behavior like the Y chromosome in African-American pregnancies that predisposes uh, those pregnancies to rates of incarceration at a level several times, as, at a level as high as the, mild, as the severe mental retardation in trisomy 1 
uh, could be advocated. How are these choices, what state-sponsored prenatal selection uh, uh, would be? How would that come about? I must emphasize that genotypes will only be moderately predictive, that probabilities and genetic concepts of causation are very difficult to understand by many groups in our society, and that a molecular phrenology could arise, the limitations of which can only un be understood by experts. A recent comment about the role of, um, of a gene related to several hormones and associated behaviors may be, and this uh, was an example that was in the newspapers in the last week or two, may be an example. There will be pressures to allow this information's use in investigations, for instance, profiling of uh, suspects, justice determinations, whether it be guilt or the genes did it, sentencing or release hearings. Examples of the use of genetic information in some of these settings already exist. Um, one widely publicized was a woman who had been convicted of murder, who then developed Huntington's disease and was released on that basis. Uh, another was the uh, use of uh, aggressive, a family history of aggressiveness in uh, trying to mitigate in a sentencing hearing uh, a murder conviction, also known as the Domino Pizza case. A recent survey of Ninth Circuit federal judges indicated a range of understanding of the limitations of the science and significant differences between lower and appellate court justices on the admissibility and prejudicial nature of this type of evidence. I just would like to conclude by saying that like other forms of genetic information, that related to behavior can be used adversely in discriminatory settings. We must understand its limitations and balance application in order to further the goals of individual freedom and a just society. Uh, I thank you for uh, <coughs> inviting me to, uh, to give my views. Um, uh, <coughs> when I was young, I was a firm believer in uh, nurture. I think after you have children, uh, you tend to move toward the uh, nature way. Uh, and so, uh, uh, to me, I think it's inescapable that many behavioral differences between people have genetic origins. That does not mean it will be easy to find them. And uh, I doubt that, uh, that even with much intelligent work, we're going to have much really to, to guide the justice system uh, over even the next 25 years. So I don't think it's a very immediate problem. But I do think we will you know, find the traits like being shy or uh, aggressive probably do reflect, in some cases, the amount of a neurotransmitter which does have a genetic basis. So I think there are differences out there to be found, and <coughs> it will there will be big rewards, I think, scientifically for those with sort of the conviction plus the intelligence and all the methodologies to find. Uh, we had one case that was even discovered at all. It's sort of an embarrassment to the, uh, the nurture people of a Dutch family which uh, there was a mutation in a gene for an enzyme called monoamine oxidase which controls the level of neurotransmitters. And um, it's an X-linked, uh, it's on the X chromosome, so it's uh, expressed in one copy in boys, but generally you don't see it in girls. Now, in that family, there was an extreme violence. And uh, following its discovery, uh, there were attempts to look at a series of violent criminals to see if any of those could be explained by it, and uh, no other case has been found. So it doesn't explain uh, any large percentage of the people who are, you know, present. Uh, but <coughs> just from first principles, uh, Society demands, it seems to me, a social, somewhat liking of other individuals. We're a social species. And that must have a genetic component, because we know if you look at different primates, they have different uh, socialities. So it would be surprising that there was no genes behind ours. And it would be 
not at all surprising, I think, if uh, single mutations could sort of disturb our you know, general liking for other people. Uh, that doesn't mean you know, that that is going to be easy to be found, but I just think uh, we just shouldn't say it doesn't exist. Uh, we'll probably be arguing these things 50 years from now. So I just want to put it in the perspective of how difficult it would be. But I think saying you know, the differences between the personalities of the people in the room you know, are largely environmental. Just flies against everything you sort of feel about other people. <laughs> Just too different. And of course it comes from seeing kids. So I think there's a good behavioral genetics field out there to find. Uh, I think if I were, you know, younger and going to go into the field, I'd work on dogs. <laughs> because we certainly know that uh, different strains have different behaviors. And it's, you know, hard to, uh, to suspect that environment has much to do with, you know, a Doberman. <laughs> so <laughs> we know it's in the genes. So if you want to study violence, you study dogs. Now, of course, uh, uh, you might say you could also study love, because some of them certainly show an extreme amount of it. So you know, I think studying behavior in dogs is going to be tricky. You know, I think 25 years from now, our, you know, we'll probably have only minor steps forward. But. Uh, you know, some dogs are more violent than others, and it has a genetic component. And to say, well, we're different from dogs, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I think we you know, have to, now how you use it in the criminal justice system, what you do with this Dutch family, you know, the fact that you, know, you uh, because someone is paranoid schizophrenic and you can say, oh, uh, or, you know, have Huntington's disease and have committed a murder, release them because uh, it sounds to me they're pretty dangerous. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so, you know, it's not because something is out of your control doesn't mean that uh, society wants them on the streets. So uh, uh, my feeling is, you know, if a, it's a good field to go into. I'd stick to dogs for a long while. And a uh, 100 years from now, I think uh, you know, the nature-nurture argument will be uh, much clearer. And we will begin to understand you know, why some of us have different personalities. And hopefully, there will be drugs which uh, uh, you know, could uh, change some things, such as we could easily be born quite unhappy if we you know, had a bad gene for our endorphins. So if you discovered that to be the case, well, you could always try opiates. Thank you. <laughs> Can you all see that up there? Because I can't. <laughs> um, my colleagues, um, Dr. Aperson, Dr. Aperson um, members of the um, panel, and distinguished colleagues, you all are a hard act to follow. Um, this is a field in which um, all sorts of things suffer from rhetoric on both sides. And I guess the, least, uh, the most important thing I can do is to try and at least um, honor the uh, company by trying to minimize the rhetoric. and trying to stick as much as I can to what I think we might know. <laughs> and I have to say right up front that what we know, and I think I concur with almost all my colleagues here, is, is, is um, interesting perhaps, but still rather pathetic um, by comparison to what there is to know. And I have to say, if you turn to my first, first slide, I think which is important to get the record straight at the start. Um, first slide, next slide please, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't think this, yeah, but this is, this is PowerPoint, and I don't think it works. There's, there's a hidden person behind the screen who's pressing the button every time I... <laughs> um, I think the important thing to say right now is 
implications of the criminal justice system, I think as all our speakers have said at present, are, are, are far from clear. And actually, with very few, very rare circumstances um, accepting, probably not even there right now. So I think that's the first thing we have to sort of be very clear about. Uh, slide. Dr. Billings has already kind of characterized the field, I thought, very helpfully. And I think it's important to realize that, um, as um, he said, there are many known genetic disorders, well-characterized genetic disorders, that do have behavioral consequences. But again, um, anybody who tries to use these uh, as, a, uh, as a way of understanding the normal variation in behavior, or even the bulk of abnormal variation in behavior, is likely to be seriously misleading. And I think, again, Dr. Billings mentioned uh, an example of that. Um, and indeed, so did Dr. Watson with his Dutch family. So I think um, we have to realize that behavior genetics is not about that. What is it about then? Next slide. Behavior genetics is not, I think, as, I, as, as the subject has evolved, uh, the attempt to show that behavior is genetic. It is an attempt. Um, a fumbling attempt, I think, in many ways, to try to characterize the causes of human differences, which are, I think, both genetic and environmental. And there are those who've argued that if you want to um, understand how the environment affects human behavior, sometimes a genetically informative design can be helpful in doing that as well. So I think it's important to realize that um, the people who do the science are not sort of monolithically and just simply hunting the genes. So there are some people who do that, but I don't. Next slide. Some of the areas, um, normal variation in behavior. And again, I think Paul helped us. Paul's almost um, you know, done this slide for me. But really, we have normal variation in behavior, um, behavioral risk factors that may influence other um, important medical disorders. Um, well, I, I think particularly, I'm, I'm concerned myself about obesity as a risk factor, for example, for hypertension and heart disease. Um, clearly, um, you know, obesity has got something to do with eating too much. So there's a sort of behavioral component to that, and trying to figure that out is, is a non-trivial question, which um, probably also has something to do with how our nervous system works, but what, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, and then, as Paul again said, behavioral disorders. We think of things like alcoholism, uh, depression, and schizophrenia. Um, Dr. Allen um, point, and Dr. Um, Billings um, indicated some of the diagnostic problems. I think, on the whole, my sense is that um, psychiatry has tried to deal fairly well over the years with problems of diagnosis to the point where um, at least it's possible within a study and sometimes between studies to achieve relatively standardized criteria for assessment. So I'm not sure that I'd necessarily agree that the whole thing is the kind of mess that it's sometimes been um, described as. And uh, clearly, um, there's much overlap between these areas. For example, if you're trying to understand um, the causes of depression, um, there's a lot of evidence that clinical depression may relate to normal variations in personality. So um, trying to sort out disorder sometimes means that you have to sort out what makes one person different from another in general. Next slide, please. This is, this is going to sound like a platitude, that the causes of variation are complex. But I think one of the things that perhaps sets me apart from some of the other people in this field is that I've actually tried to collect data. And <laughs> I think my point is that um, when you collect the data, you do actually wind up with a perspective which is not unlike the one that Dr. Allen presented. We might disagree about some of the details, but I think in terms of um, the broad picture of what creates human diversity in behavior, Clearly, there is not a monolithic view. Um, not I say monolithic view. I mean, there is, um, there is not a single cause for anything. And I just list some of the things there. And yes, I do list genetic diversity genes there as one of the components that contribute to differences between humans and to risk for disease and, in particular, risk for psychiatric disorders. But that is by no means the whole story. And I think anybody who tries to claim that or build a world view on it is seriously um, deluded. Um, 
the social and the physical environment, the interaction between child and parent, and so on and so forth, are clearly and demonstrably important in certain forms of human variability. Um, sheer chance, um, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. It's very interesting I mean, that if you look at even identical twins who've been reared in the same home, for example, their life histories and developmental trajectories are astonishingly um, variable. Um, indeed, it's kind of interesting that identical, if you compared me today with me in two years' time, it would not be unlike comparing me today with my identical twin today. Um, the short, there are a lot of short-term um, random environmental influences which are important in determining how people behave on the day. Um, it's very interesting that one of the things I think is kind of behavior genetic research is a new appreciation not just for the environment but to sometimes for the accidental character of the environment. That many of the things we think of as being environmentally important turn out perhaps not to be as important and yet many of the things we haven't even begun to think about yet are. And the in individual life experiences of the individual, even the uniqueness of that individual within the family is a significant component of um, what makes us us. Um, again, two of our speakers mentioned gene environment interaction. Um, that can sometimes be a kind of uh, a, a sort of a, a buzzword for confusion. Um, in, the, in the eyes of the geneticist, gene environment interaction has a very specific connotation. It really means that how you react to the environment, how you react to changes in the environment, is partly um, a response to the genes of the individual. An example of this is some of the work my um, just a colleague of mine has just published, I think, in Archives of General Psychiatry. Um, Judy Silberg has been looking at some of our population-based sample of twins, adolescent twins, and looking at the development of um, depressive symptoms in twins. It's a severe and debilitating disorder if you have depression as a kid. And she shows, in fact, there's a very small but a significant genetic component. But there's two things about that genetic component. One is that it seems to only appear after adolescence. So there's a real puzzle there about what it is about the control, and I use that word in quotes, <laughs> of, of development that leads to a radical transformation in the way individual differences are created. The second thing she shows is that um, you only begin to see genetic differences in individuals who've been exposed to severe adverse life events. So that clearly to make the person, you need to be looking at genes and environment in combination. The thing I think that none of our speakers have mentioned, and again that's probably because they don't have data but we do, is um, this phenomenon of gene-environment correlation. It feeds into the notion that it's a very long pathway between what the genes do and behavior. There's, the path from DNA to phenotype is extraordinarily long, and it involves um, complex interactions between the organism, the individual, and the world outside. And so, for example, we can show in our, see in our twin studies that if you look at how children interact with their mothers, identical twins indeed interact more similarly than non-identical twins. Now, there are people that say, well, that proves the genes affect the environment. Uh, my response to that is, no, what it's showing you is that um, the individual development is a real conversation between the organism and that organism's ecosystem. And in a way, Fixing the genes may not be the way to sort of help that person's development, but it provides a lot of opportunities for us to see that um, the environment can sometimes, can sometimes actually exacerbate and exaggerate pre-existing differences. And so if you look at, as we have in our um, studies of conduct disorder um, symptoms in, again, adolescent kids, you find that apparently, firstly, some very important things are true, that um, it seems that insofar as there may be some genetic differences, they're very age-dependent in their expression. That 
adolescent forms of behavioral abnormality, for example, are not the same as adult forms of behavioral development, behavioral abnormality. Even though the symptoms might be the same, the causes might be different. So there's a series of sort of complexities, I think, that you get into when you get into the data, which are actually, you know, if in a sense I say, well, he says the problem's bad, I say it's a whole lot worse, but it's also a lot more interesting. Developmental change, I've talked about that. Genes do different things, and the environment does different things at different times in the organism's, in, in the organism's life. And that is something that, you know, <laughs> um, it's naive to discount that, and the data forces to take this into account. And I said the pathways are longer interacting. Next slide, please. Current models are at best crude approximations. That doesn't mean they have no value. That is no scientific value. I would be very cautious about imputing to them legal or major social value. Slide. Genes seem to influence many, if not most, of uh, measurable aspects of human behavior. And of course, there's a whole lot of things that are really interesting about people, but it's actually very hard to measure. But let's look at those things that are. But there's a big but to all of that. And I'll just list the buts. Next slide. So I can't read the butts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, the effects of the environment are large, and sometimes larger. Um, for many of the things that we're interested in in the psychiatric domain, genes do play an important role, apparently, but the environmental effects are as large and if not larger. Secondly, as all our speakers have said, and I would only underscore this, that few, if any, specific genes have been identified. And even in those cases where there have been claims about the identification of, uh, of specific genes, replication has been a problem, and we have been very far, typically, from locating the particular genes on the regions of the chromosome. I mean, nobody, to my knowledge yet, has read off a gene that causes schizophrenia. That doesn't mean somebody won't succeed at some point. But that's not where we are right now. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> uh, are they really there yet? I know, I know, I know they've, got, they've got linkage on chromosome 6, but I think it's sort of all over. It's, I mean, it's a wide range of the map. Oh, you must know Ken better than I do. <laughs> Kendler. Um, genetic, genetic effects depend on context. That's things like age, sex, and environment. And sometimes you know, different genes are expressed in highly idiosyncratic ways in different contexts. The number of genes, I think now, I, mean, I grew up in the school of genetics which recognized that even quite simple things were caused by lots of genes. I remember being told by a colleague who works on um, penicillin production in the fungus Aspergillus nidulans that he had found at least 200 genes that had some impact on that, on that relatively simple um, function. I would be astonished if the number of genes affecting complex human traits like behavior were not very large indeed. Um, Dr. Watson knows better than I, but I think the last count was probably about 30,000 genes, probably had some impact on the brain out of the 100,000 we're dealing with. So it's, there's a big haystack out there. The environments, I have to say, are probably no less numerous. There are, not, there are some environmental factors, or at least major ways of stratifying the human population, which are important. But when people have tried very often, for example, to explain the environment that makes one identical twin different from another, they've actually had quite a hard time doing that. So that even though there's this enorm there are these enormous environmental differences, actually characterizing that environment is still a major research goal, for which we've only been partly successful. Um, long and complex pathways from the DNA to the phenotype. And I just want to say, too, that the resolving power of many of the studies we do is really pathetically small. And just to give you an example, um, some of the calculations that my colleagues and I have done suggest, suppose we said we want to find a gene using linkage methods, as one of the methods geneticists use, that explains 10% of the variation in a complex trait. Now, 10% 
It may not sound much, but actually from a genetic perspective, it's a large chunk. And we talk about needing perhaps 30,000 SIB pairs to do that. So was, you know, we're using a, a very blunt set of tools very often, and Dr. Allen talks about the, um, the need to do animal studies, and indeed there are the possibilities now, and some of my colleagues are exploiting the possibility of moving back between the mouse and the human genome in the attempt to do just that. Whether they will succeed is another question. And finally, and again I think um, two of our speakers made this point, um, prediction is very weak and virtually impossible at the individual level. And I think it's very important to say that, and all this adds up to that. Next slide. Some final comments then, and I, it's tough for me to read these, but I think I'll just summarize some of the issues that I see as, uh, well, in fact, almost non-issues at, at some level. I mean, I think the important thing is to say that I don't have a recipe as a result of spending 20 years in this field to recommend to you guys what you should do. The most I would suggest, perhaps, is that we, one, watch this space, and it's better to watch the space now than watch it in, probably Dr. Watson may be right, 25 years' time. Um, the other thing I would say is that we do perhaps need to ditch some of the rhetoric about genes and determinism. I think it points to a big issue, and that is that we have basically as a, an intellectual community dealt very badly with the question of determinism and science. I mean, environmental models are just as deterministic as genetic ones. And so I think it causes us to ask the question, how do we construct the concepts of freedom and responsibility in a world where we are increasingly looking at basic aspects of our lives in a deterministic framework? That is the scientific, epidemiological, psychological, and so on framework. So I think, we, insofar as we have an apparatus to deal with these issues already, it may be the, the same apparatus needs to be looked at in relation to our genes. In other words, we don't need to throw our, we don't have to throw our anthropology out of the window in the light of genetics. But what we have to do is to take our anthropology very seriously indeed, and start asking what does it mean to be free and responsible. And finally, I think. Um, <laughs> The issue of mutual responsibility, this is more a medical than a legal issue. But the sense of, um, speaking of someone as a sort of walking genetic time bomb for almost every nasty disease you can think of, um, I'm very concerned indeed that um, as a society, um, I should not be the one to bear the burden of my genetic risk. And I think the concept that of mutual responsibility and a mutual responsibility and sharing of the risk of being human is something that I think I would um, want to at least put out there seriously for our um, scholarly consideration. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your presentations. Um, one of the tangential issues that the Commission has not focused on greatly is that, in fact, now we essentially have in place uh, throughout the United States state laws that provide for the collection, as you know, of DNA samples from convicted felons. And at the moment, they're being stored. I want to ask you a question about research on those samples. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine, despite the, uh, my agreement with the time frame suggested for behavioral and genetics, that there could be an interest, for example, in identifying a thousand individuals whose phenotype was conviction of extremely violent crimes with very clear evidence. Their DNA sample is present. And somebody wants to just say, let's, look, let's sequence the monamine oxidase A gene in all 1,000 of them, and let's run a control sample of 1,000 samples of individuals who don't show that. And what if they only found 10, that is 1% of the individuals had truncating mutations in the protein to suggest they had a problem? Research like that is feasible today and could have implications far beyond its scientific importance. Would you permit or deny such research? I would look forward to it. 
because we might <coughs> you know, begin to understand uh, asocial behavior. I'm not sure we find them, but uh, I can see no one harmed by doing this research. In fact, I could see great benefit to society. Um, Phil, how, how would you see that as different than the criminal chromosome research that was done um, 20 years ago? Now, gee, I thought as a commissioner I was asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and well, while I'll be happy to make the well, distinctions, well, I'm like not going to let you off the hook until you, you answer my question well, first and then I'll answer yours. I, I, I think that the, um, while I think that the uh, academic value uh, might be interesting primarily to refute, I suspect, the monoamine oxidase hypothesis of uh, much of, uh, and its correlation with aggression, um, the problem is uh, how, to co how to control the use of that information, for instance, in legal settings. Uh, and its uh, potential prejudicial nature in a variety of, of, uh, uh, of non-scientific settings. So uh, I, I, though I, I might agree with Jim that it, it would be really interesting to know the answer to that study, I, it's a kind of study which is so fraught with problems that I wonder whether we should, we can actually accomplish it. I, I think this is it's totally wrong. Uh, because if you found the cause, you might be able to help the people. You know, if it's a neurotransmitter, you might uh, be able to uh, control <coughs> behavior which would otherwise, you know, lead to people spending their whole lives in prisons. So uh, uh, I don't see what's wrong with getting the knowledge. That doesn't mean anyone is going to be hurt by that knowledge. Of course, people could be hurt by it, but that's what you have a legal system for, to try and use knowledge fairly. But uh, I find people, a large fraction of people, just don't want us to get the knowledge under the argument that it's going to be misused. And uh, uh, to me, uh, it's just blatant disregard for the tragedies of the people who are in prison. And uh, so I favor of understanding why some people do behavior which we think is so asocial. Uh, I think it's going, as I said before, I think it's going to be very hard to find it. And I'm not sure one would be, you know, sensible spending much of your career doing it now. But if someone could do it and get answers, I think society would benefit. Dr. Eves? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Do I have to press? Just oh, thanks. <clears throat> There's a piece of me which is absolutely intrigued by that possibility. Um, and in fact, it's even more intriguing, perhaps, than looking at the MAO gene. <coughs> because um, the way molecular genetics is going now, um, as we're increasingly able to characterize more and more genes, um, to be able to do that in, lar I mean, in large case control studies, if you can get proper cases and controls, um, is I mean, if we were talking about depression, for example, um, there would be no question of that being a, a study perhaps that's worth doing. Um, there's a piece of me which wonders whether I'm nevertheless Oppenheimer just about to sign up for Las Alamos. And that's the problem. Um, a tip, well, let, me, let, me, let me finish. I think there, there, is, an, there is an issue here about, um, I mean, there are some major, I mean, uh, we, we, I don't think we need to rehearse here the human subjects issues that are, you know, uh, 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 that are around the use of prisoners um, for research and, and, and the issues of form, informed consent. So I think that, that, would, that, that is an issue that I would, I'd be very anxious about seeing properly dealt with. The other thing, um, uh, I do think, however, that Dr. Watson's point is, is a very important one, that um, as we think through, if, if all other things could be, could be, could be sort of um, taken care of, as we think through the implications, clearly we can think of all the negatives about how such information might be, might be used. Secondly, we need to be particularly aware of all the misunderstandings that could ensue because um, there's probably, a, you know, if, if, if there are 10, 10 people in jail which because of the way that gene has played out in their lives, there may be another 2,000 who are not in jail whose gene has played out in quite different ways. 
And I think there'll be a severe danger of using that information to characterize individuals prior to um, you know, their, their lives playing out their, playing out their course. So it, it's, I, I'm a great sort of, um, I have a paper out there on, on, the, on chaos theory in, in behavior genetics. And I have a great sense that sort of sometimes when the butterfly does flap its wings in, in Ceylon, the hurricane happens in Massachusetts. And um, it's very hard for us to foresee all the implications of what seems like a great idea now. Uh, Bill, if, I, <coughs> if I understood your uh, question, you were saying suppose you could do a thousand surveys and ten turned up uh, of these uh, of genes with the monomine, monomine oxidase deficiency. Of let's some say sort. just to or some percent, clarify, let's some say that ten percent. out of the thousand. Yeah. Violent offenders were positive for a truncating mutation, right. and none of a thousand controls were. Then the, the, I'd be concerned about that research in several ways. I mean, one, it might be interesting to do that characterization itself. The question that I want to see followed up is one: uh, what are the other components of the genetic background involved in those cases and the control group cases? I'm particularly concerned that the incidents that, sure, if you could help the people that are in prison, that's fine, but that, that's uh, way off in terms of any uh, known uh, physiological or therapeutic mechanism. Uh, the XYY case, in fact, is uh, an exemplary one in this uh, instance, and I don't know whether people are aware of that, but in the early 1960s, a claim was made that a significantly higher proportion of males in uh, prison, the original study was done in uh, Edinburgh, uh, had an extra Y chromosome, and it was thought that this might have something to do with their criminal or antisocial behavior. Uh, that correlation, for a variety of reasons, turned out not to have any predictive value uh, uh, at all. But in the course of the time, it was used to claim that Richard Speck and other people uh, who were thought to have an XYY, they didn't, he, Speck didn't. Uh, but a proposal was, uh, if you recall, was set up here in Massachusetts to do a newborn screening <coughs> for XYY. Uh, and it was eventually shut down for one of the major reasons that uh, it could lead to self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, you have this information about, and if you, you take your uh, 10 out of 1,000 criminals, but if you do that and you now start extending that to genetic screening, I think you have a very serious problem. And without knowledge about genetic background, genetic interactions, with no knowledge about the actual environmental upbringing and background of those individuals, I think that that would be a highly reductionist and highly oversimplistic uh, conclusion to draw that it, uh, the, those 10 genes differences had anything necessarily to do with the individuals being in prison. Are there any other questions by the commission? And we do want to leave time for uh, open public discussion, which the commission would be interested in, too. Any other comments or questions by the commissioners? And one question, would it make any difference if you started the research the other way and you said, all right, uh, let's look at pedophiles, which is a uh, particularly uh, troubling uh, kind of crime. Uh, we even have the United States Supreme Court opinion and a number of statutes that say that courts can permanently incarcerate people who have been convicted of pedophilia if they find that they have an inherent, or gen and you could easily read into that term, uh, genetic basis for the disorder. Um, and please also bear in mind that uh, uh, what might be interesting information uh, in the abstract to geneticists, please remember we as lawyers and judges in the system, we will take the smallest <laughs> association and use it uh, for release decisions, for guilt or innocence determinations, because in many ways it looks like and arguably could be better than a lot of the data that uh, uh, comes into court, so it might seem that way. So would you have any inherent, Dr. Watson, uh, uh, ethical objection to just saying, let's take all the convicted pedophiles and, and study those blood samples? Well, if you found something, uh, <coughs> if you could find something, uh, I don't see necessarily the harm. I mean, you have to, as a scientist, you have to ask, well, are you wasting your time? But I think you're more or less saying we shouldn't get knowledge because the legal and judicial system is uh, bad. 
<laughs> and the <laughs> lawyer is get off <laughs> people. So I mean, it, you know, it seems to me that that is not a, that the failure of the legal system shouldn't be that we shouldn't find out uh, a basis of a behavior which is uh, pretty scary. Well, I'm very sensitive to lawyer and judge bashing. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure it's not genetic, it's nurture. Uh, but I'll turn it over to uh, Director Jackson. Thank you very much, Madam Chief Justice. Uh, it's time for your opportunity. We have participants uh, in our conference on DNA and the criminal justice system. You are welcome to participate along with students and others from the community. There are two mics on the floor and two on the second floor and do I see someone okay please again the only ground rules are <laughs> a question not a speech and if you're comfortable please identify who you are thank you uh, my name is Josh and I'm a sophomore here um, <clears throat> dr. Watson when you when you spoke here last year at the Science Center uh, you seem to condone if I had it right you condoned uh, eugenics in some way or another. Do you and the rest of the panel also, I'm curious if you see uh, some form of, of um, test on genes, much like an early warning test that's now being done for something like breast cancer. If you see a test like that that can be done, maybe as you were describing with infants, uh, looking for specific genes that might lead to um, criminal action later in life, and using that as an early warning system to, to treat people early as is done, being done or with breast cancer now, or at least screening for breast cancer right now. Were you addressing your comments to me? Well, I'm addressing the panel. I'm curious if you see a future in which that can be done. You can screen people early for criminal behavior and watch for it as they age. I'll throw it an answer while we're, we're deliberating up here. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I mean, the, the problem with those early warning signals is the predictive value and the difficulty of the predictive value from simply knowing the genotype. Uh, it certainly is in cases of, of breast cancer, it may be very useful to know that. Uh, it may be very useful to guide your diet and your lifestyle and so on so as to minimize those effects actually showing up as phenotype. Uh, I would say those would be good things anyway. You don't need to have a genetic excuse for leading a good lifestyle and having uh, uh, breast exams periodically and all those uh, things. So the, they can be useful uh, if the genetics is really clear, if the predictability is really clear, uh, they can also be, uh, again, uh, a cloud uh, following you around your whole life and determining all kinds of ways you react and ways people react to you. And what's particularly troubling to me is in the context of the HMO and healthcare system, uh, the use of that kind of early warning diagnosis as a means of determining uh, whether coverage uh, is going to be included for that fetus or whether, in fact, the insurance rates will go up and so on. And I think those are very troubling contextual issues for uh, having those early, uh, how you interpret those early warning signals. Yeah, can I just add another comment? Very often, um, I can't speak to criminality, but very often the single best predictor of how people are going to turn out as adults is to look at their parents. And what I'm, I think what I'm saying here is that um, <laughs> the, yeah, God forbid, exactly. I mean, and, uh, and, uh, and if, uh, but the facts of the case are, you know, if, if, if you go to see your doctor, what's the very first thing you do when you sign up? You fill out a family history. Why? Because those are pertinent risk factors, and they're a whole lot more predictive than anything so far, I think, to have come out of, um, well, certainly behavior genetics. So, I mean, I, let me throw the question back to you. Um, would you, what kind of follow-up would you advocate for the children of people who are in jail? Are you asking me? Yeah, I am. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, because um, you know, I ain't no great ethicist, but I mean, I, the reason I pose the question, I mean, in a sense, gene in this case, the, the DNA, to some extent, I mean, it has this kind of, you know, scientific thing about sort of precision and all that, but when it comes down to it, there are better predictors already out there. And my question would be, to you as a member of society, what use would you make of these okay. other predictors that are out there? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to apply them. I don't believe in eugenics in any way. 
I, I, uh, can I, I know you do. That's one of the reasons no, I no, asked. Okay. I, 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 and then we'll move to the next no, question. No. So, so you, if you were a woman, would not test for Down syndrome? That's... <laughs> That's eugenics. I, I might test for it, but I wouldn't necessarily kill the baby if it had Down syndrome. But uh, would you uh, think that uh, someone who decided to terminate a pregnancy was, uh, in some sense, uh, an immoral person? Yes, I would, Dr. Watson. OK, I don't. OK, uh, Pat, Billy. I just wanted to say, that, uh, Josh, that the, um, the comment I made in my remarks, um, there are predictors for uh, later uh, incarceration, for instance, the Y chromosome is a rather, act a rather uh, accurate predictor of incarceration, particularly in certain communities. Um, it, that particular fact, that association, doesn't really help us understand anything except for uh, about uh, social issues and racism and poverty and the historical issues. It doesn't really uh, lend any, uh, that's, that, that science isn't particularly instructive in and of itself. And, uh, uh, I, I think it also suggests, as uh, my comments uh, also were trying to get at, that um, how we construct the care of or the issues surrounding things like uh, criminality or, for that matter, ment mental retardation associated with Down syndrome uh, might affect how we use these tests and how individuals as well as states use those tests. Thank, Thank you. you. Young lady. Hi. My name is uh, Hillary Robinson, and I'm a sophomore here at the college as well. And I wanted to ask a question that went specifically kind of to the topic of the use of DNA in the criminal justice system. Um, I just wanted to point out for discussion and get the feelings of the panel on um, the possibilities and kind of the, um, the problems involved with the fact that the samples that we would base anything on are predetermined by be behavior as opposed to being decided on any sort of a, an objective basis. Um, being both kind of a woman and a biracial minority, I had noticed the somewhat homogeneity of the panel and wanted to point out that we have a justice system which is dominated by African men between the ages of 18 and 30, I believe. I don't know any specific statistics. Um, but you know, in the event that we did that kind of a survey, it would certainly be affected by that fact. Um, and I just wanted to find out if there's any scientific connection which would affect the genotypes and the phenotypes and kind of the connections between the two and, you know, point out the difficulties of basing any conclusions on a sample which doesn't reflect the rest of the population. Yeah, I think that point's very well taken. And in fact, it's very interesting that when geneticists try to pick apart the genetic components of complex diseases, one of the issues they are particularly sensitive to is the misleading results that you can that you can arrive at if you deal with a population which is actually structurally genetically heterogeneous and you take non-representative slices of that. Um, this applies. I mean, obviously, one of the most glaring issues of this is, is the one of racial div racial diversity, as you as you um, imagine. But I mean, even um, any other source of um, what genetic technical population stratification can be a source of um, errors of inference in, the, in, in these kinds of studies. So one has to be you know, pretty cautious about doing wild things. Dr. Allen, did you? Yeah, just a quick response to that. That is certainly a major uh, issue with many of these studies. There's one going on right now in uh, New York at the New York Psychiatric Hospital, uh, sponsored by NIMH, uh, taking the younger siblings of uh, African American and Latin American uh, 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 brothers who are currently incarcerated as adolescents and doing a whole series of physiological and behavioral studies on two groups of those. One uh, ages uh, six months to 36 months and another group uh, ages six to nine, I think. And take him to do a hospital clinical situation every uh, six weeks doing a series of blood tests and a whole bunch of things to try to find predictors for the uh, future criminal adolescent behavior that these kids might uh, experience. And one of the critics of that uh, 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 study pointed out that there's a very serious flaw in that and that uh, a very large percentage of these children from this socioeconomic background and neighborhood would in fact end up in prison anyway because of the socioeconomic conditions that they come from. And there was, in this particular study, there was no control group or comparison group. But the fact is that uh, 
people in families and people in communities share many things in common besides their uh, genetic background. And so not to be able to take, to take those things into account renders such studies virtually meaningless. Thank you. Can I ask a question about that, though? I mean, let's just suppose that they were to complete this study and were to show that um, there was heterogeneity within the sibling group in outcome as a function of, I mean, let, let's suppose, gene for the sake of argument. This is a, a hopelessly naive thing. Um, you could argue they've done, the, the, as, as controlled an experiment, at least as is possible to do, because um, you know, they're, they're all coming from the, the, sort of the group which is sort of naively identified as high risk, and what you're actually trying to do is, is look at heterogeneity within that group. So in some sense, it would be trying to meet some of the criticisms that you're, that you're sort of um, advancing toward, advancing at it. It'd be one, I'm sorry. It would be um, trying to meet by design some of the questions that you're sort of, um, you know, you, you're some of the criticisms that you're making. Certainly the experiment and, and, and study could have been designed better. Uh, the question is whether you really could get at uh, the question that you were asking, or whether, and this again gets back to the issue of uh, having a, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy of these kids now being labeled as high risk when they themselves have done nothing, and only their brothers or siblings are in prison. So I th we have a question on the that. second floor, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nasser, and I run a, a little biotechnology company in Cambridge. Uh, there was a conference here last week at Harvard about the aid problem in Africa. And one of the major uh, speaker <coughs> uh, mentioned that he's hoping some less virulent virus will come along and it will calm down the problem in Africa. Uh, the question I have is the, uh, the mutation problem. Now, he, these people think, now, since they cannot afford all these AZT and all sorts of drugs, maybe the mutation will help them out. Will there any... Uh, connection with mutation and the genetic understanding uh, in, in this field. Uh, I, I don't think it would be very wise to count on a mutation arising which would diminish the AIDS dilemma which is arising in Africa. Thank you. We'll take a question here. Hello, my name is Josh Laxina, and I'm a sophomore at the college. I wanted to go back to Dr. Allen's point about self-fulfilling prophecy. If we are, at some future point, able to come up with a test that shows genetic predisposition to violence, then how is society supposed to cope with the possibility that if there is testing for this violent predisposition at birth, people could possibly grow up under the stigma thinking all the time that they will simply grow up to be violent, and that is an inescapable life that they will have to lead. And I wanted to address that to Dr. Watson. How are we to deal with the problem of self-fulfilling prophecy with the genetic testing? Well, you could say it would go that way, but you could say it would go the other way, that you're sort of warned, you know, that uh, you have this tendency, and uh, so you'd be more careful. I can't tell you which way it would go, but... Uh, uh, in my case, I think uh, I'd be more careful. <laughs> I, I guess the other thing I would say, which has to do with the difference between broad application of genetic testing, which we call genetic screening, and uh, individualized sort of family-shaped uh, genetic testing, which is the most common use of genetic testing uh, in individuals now, uh, is that uh, genetic screening usually requires there need, that there is something you can do with the information, uh, that there is some treatment or preventative, whether it be direct or complementary, um, which um, allows you to act on the information in a positive way, and that that's been vetted through the uh, normal scientific and medical kinds of processes. And so um, I think that you're not going to see uh, this kind of predispositional testing in a sort of screening motif uh, until there is something you can do about it. And um, I'm not sure that's uh, very likely to happen very tiny time soon. The bad news is that we have uh, run out of time. The good news is that our panelists, as well as commission members, are going to be available and that you are all welcome to join us for refreshments behind uh, the platform where I'm standing. I'm going to invoke the 
prerogative of the chair to allow for two quick questions. If you'll address them to one panelist only, we'll start with you here. Thank you. Well, you kind of ruined my plan a little bit. Um, my name is Alyssa Berman. I'm reporting from the Harvard Crimson. I'm an undergraduate. And I actually wanted to pose my question to the commission. So anyone that would like to field this question, please do. Um, I realize that this, the focus of this forum is mainly on the justice system. But as DNA, as DNA information becomes more available, um, the implications are going to extend far greater than within the justice system itself, particularly um, my concern is involving genetic discrimination. Um, so really a twofold question, how do you plan on regulating um, whether or not um, employers or insurance companies should have access to this information? And if so, how do you plan on preventing potential discrimination by the fact that they possess such information? The executive director of the commission will answer that question. He's the paid help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, I, I, I guess the, the, the best way to, to tackle that issue is first is a bit of a disclaimer is, is recognizing the extent to which this commission um, has dealt with the issue of the use of DNA in a purely forensic context, which is different than what you're talking about. Not to say that what you're talking about um, exceeds the bounds of the legal system because there are obviously legal issues that would be created from that kind of, um, uh, of utilization. Mm -hmm. However, what we can say is that the way that these databases are currently constructed and the way that, number one, the national CODA system was constructed um, requires that these samples that are taken are only used for criminal justice purposes. And even beyond that, those individual states that were creating state databases and using this code of software necessarily had to pass legislation, which essentially said the same thing, that these samples could only be used for criminal justice purposes under, uh, under you know, these certain circumstances. Now, I would like to say that all the states um, responded uniformly and specifically in terms of criminal penalties being allocated for the misuse of, of database samples. Uh, unfortunately, however, there hasn't been that kind of uniformity. And in fact, we range from very specific legislation regarding criminal penalties for misuse to samples that can be used for, quote unquote, any humanitarian purpose. That obviously leaves wiggle room towards um, uh, kinds of considerations that I think are indicative of the, of the fears that you express uh, in, in, in the nature of your question. Good job, the, the last question. If I, if I might. If um, Director Jackson, here I am. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry man. I'm going to ask uh, Philip Riley to comment. Uh, we've all been concerned with issues of privacy and issues of use of uh, uh, genetic material, not only in um, the criminal justice system, but outside, and I think Dr. Riley can address that. Uh, before so, so doing, I might... Uh, Note that Paul Billings has spent a good amount of his time in the last decade making the public aware of these issues. Uh, in re direct response to the question, I would uh, suggest to the reporter that a good thing to do would be to um, build your story around the fact that a few weeks ago, Massachusetts became the 39th state to specifically attempt to regulate the use of genetic information in at least group health underwriting. The statute also speaks to life insurance and employment issues. Uh, in addition, there's at least one federal statute that attempts to deal with the health insurance issue. It certainly has not resolved the problem, but in fact, I think the last 10 years shows a growing dialogue in the state legislatures, and this is largely from a federalist point of view, a state matter about these issues. And the answer can only be for the next 25 years, one of a vigilance uh, and a dialogue between society and science. Thank you, Dr. Riley. The last question. I'm sorry, uh, my name is Mara Hernandez. I am a student at the Kennedy School of Government. And uh, I've come to realize that my question is really more for, also for this part of the, <laughs> of the um, table. And uh, I was wondering maybe uh, would some of these negative effects of having genetic information could be lessened by uh, uh, even including in the Bill of Rights um, the privacy of any genetic information, like as a key uh, fundamental of uh, preventing any misuse of this kind of genetic information? Phil? 
<laughs> I'm tempted to say yes, Shirley. <laughs> um, I, I, I will answer it tangentially and only because the chair asked me to, not because I think I'm the most competent person. I could imagine a, um, a time in the first quarter of this century where a case appears before the United States Supreme Court to address exactly that issue. Is the um, judge-made doctrine of pri privacy that arises out of the interstices of the Bill of Rights broad enough to include the right to control the privacy of genetic information? And I can imagine even how the opinion would be written and what cases would be cited going back to the birth control cases in the 1960s. Yeah, we, should, we should add that um, much of the debate that this commission has taken up even today um, relates to these issues, and just to be specific about it, there are significant questions and division in this commission over whether or not, as Phil referred to before, we should be saving the blood samples collected in the convicted offender database for the very reasons that came out of the questioning in terms of uh, focusing these, this research on uh, uh, certain classes of people, and we had a big debate today about uh, collecting uh, what are known as suspect samples and saving those. So we've been debating around these issues in the context of our criminal justice uh, uh, concerns. And as Phil said, the constitutional issue about some enhanced right to uh, protect your genetic data would change almost all of the, uh, de would, would, would determine a lot of the questions that we've been debating and frankly couldn't resolve with this commission, which we've, sunsets we've, today. We've certainly discussed where you may be concerned with what the medical facilities do, like when you go for physical, what happens to the blood that's taken while you're, you're at a physical and those kinds of things, and that the law enforcement issues that we've dealt with is for the purpose of identification and criminal justice. And if you have a fear of those fears that you establish, we ought to direct them outside of the, the criminal justice system as well. I just wanted to add, the, in 1992, the largest state in the union, uh, the legislature passed a amendment to the Unruh Civil Rights Act of the state of California, which would have done exactly uh, what you suggested uh, for the state of California. Uh, that was uh, vetoed by the then uh, governor. Uh, and, but much of the protections have been enacted in that state and many other states in an incremental way uh, since that time. Uh, but I think your question gets to a very important issue, which is what would the role be of a more broad-reaching kind of right uh, and its impact both on the growth of biotechnology, the application of genetic information, uh, and uh, the individual in our society in the future. The state of California actually has the right of privacy in our constitution, which other uh, states may not have. So we may have that protection without it, and despite uh, Governor Wilson's veto. Let me uh, conclude by observing that uh, this obviously is a serious and complex issue. Uh, this discussion, I believe, has been rich and informative, suggestive of the additional 25 presentations which will be made to this conference over the next uh, two days. Uh, all of the observations from panelists, including the four uh, assembled in front of you, are, will be available on our website, and uh, fuller remarks and observations uh, will be chronicled in a book uh, and a proceedings uh, from this conference in subsequent months. Uh, the confluence of issues of science and public values uh, need to be reconciled as best they can through a process which is public and legitimate and engenders trust. We hope that uh, this forum and tomorrow afternoon's forum with uh, Attorney General Reno, the public proceedings of this conference will help uh, stimulate that public confidence and understanding of complex issues which will shape our future for many generations to come. Let me again, on behalf of the Chief Justice and the Commission, thank our four panelists, encourage all of you to join us for a reception, and give them a round warm of applause. <laughs> round, round of applause. <laughs> and my apologies to the <laughs> <laughs> you guys are great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.